Amen. Good morning. Happy Easter. It, you do look good from up here, by the way. All right, so hey, here's the deal. You've already heard it. Like, I feel like I just need to give an altar call and we're done at this point. Like, this is the day that death is defeated. You got that? That's not, yeah, you can clap. That is not a bad thing. It is the day, guys, year upon year. Like, it's every day we can declare this, but this is the designated day where the church of Jesus Christ all over the world rises up and in the face of darkness and death says, no, not for me, not forever, and not for anyone who believes in Jesus. No. We move from darkness to light this day. We move from death to life this day, and it is one heck of a good day. And so if you are thinking that I'm going to slow down in terms of how fast I talk today, you are going to be gravely disappointed. <laughs> you can go home and watch it on TV and like slow it down, you know, like, oh, that's what he said. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to start with a little bit of a confession, and, and my confession is that I'm moderately insecure about this message, and the reason for that is like back in November, December, I chose a story from the Bible to talk about today, okay? And when I chose it, I thought, this is going to be amazing. Like, this is, this is going to be so cool. Like, this is, this is creative. This is unique. This is, and then I set it aside, and then I picked it up again on like Tuesday or Wednesday of this week, and I thought, this might be the weirdest story that anyone has ever talked about in the history of Christianity, not on a regular Sunday, but on an Easter. All right, so here's why I chose it in defense of me. Uh, for starters, just 40,000 feet, it involves the Apostle Paul. Let's just pause, I feel good about that. The Apostle Paul is an amazing guy. I mean, when you run through the list of people who have literally changed the world, it's a short list, he's on it, and he's on everyone's list. Incredible, so I'm like, all right, that's, that's good. Paul is involved in a storm. Now, just stop there for a minute. His is a literal storm. I understand that, but we're all involved in storms in different ways and different times in our lives. Are we not? I get it. We get hurricanes. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about storms in your life. Feels sort of relevant. So we've got Paul. We've got this relevant thing of the storm. The storm is so severe in his case. He's on a ship, by the way, in the sea, in the storm, and he experiences a shipwreck. So Paul, in a storm that makes shipwreck of his life, I can relate. I, I, I'm good. I'm with you. I'm dialed in, Tom. I feel like, no, maybe this is a good choice. Here's the last piece, and it's the weird part. It also involves a snake. I'm going to be honest, that's what attracted me to the story. I just thought, who doesn't like a good snake story, you know, on Easter? Anyway. But here's what you need to know about the snake. The snake in the Bible is the very emblem of evil and death. I mean, when the evil one, Satan himself, goes into the Garden of Eden to tempt our first parents to eat of the forbidden fruit, you know the story. He doesn't come as a talking Labrador retriever. He comes as a talking snake, and he's a deadly snake. And as you look at all the snake stories in the Bible, which believe it or not, there are several, to be bitten by a snake in the Bible, is to die without exception. Oh, wait, no, there is one exception. This story. He doesn't die. It's curious. But what does any of this have to do with Easter? Nothing, that's why I'm insecure. But it has everything to do with Easter if, if you can see that it's not a story just about Paul and a storm and a shipwreck and a snake but really what is ultimately is a story about Jesus and his suffering and his death and his resurrection from the dead by which he defeats evil and death for me and by which he defeats evil and death for you and by which he defeats evil and death for anyone who will have him. Oh, and by the way, and this is the part that I don't want you to miss, the story makes it absolutely clear that that Jesus is with you in your storms that make shipwreck of your life and when evil and death come to overwhelm even when you can't see him. Don't miss that. So we find our oddly wonderful story in Acts chapter 27, where as I've already said, the apostle Paul is on board a ship and he's traveling to Rome and he's a prisoner on the ship. Why is he a prisoner on the ship? Because he's going to Rome for being a Christian. He's gonna be tried there for being a Christian. So just take that in for a second. The apostle Paul is out proclaiming life in the face of death, light in the face of darkness. He's healing people, he's delivering people, he's manifesting the power of Christ. He's the one who is bringing salvation, right? Abundant eternal life to all who believe like he is 
is, by our definition at the very least, out there doing good things. He's going to go to Rome. He's going to be tried. And eventually, do you know how he dies? His head is cut off. You're like, this does not sound encouraging. And it's not just him. What about Peter? What happened to him? Crucified upside down. What about Thomas? What happened to him? Run through with spears. Let me just go down the list. All of these guys who give us these stories that we find in the New Testament, all the sources for all the writings of the New Testament, suffered and died terribly painful deaths. You're like, wow, I think I'm learning something about Christianity that does not exempt you from suffering. No, it doesn't, but it gives meaning and purpose to it. Everybody suffers, guys. And those who suffer in a world in which they believe there's no God, there's no way to be reconciled to this God, there's no life coming after this, suffer meaninglessly, at least in their hearts and minds, do they not? What was the point of the sufferings of these guys? These guys were not afraid of death, and here's why. They had literally physically seen a man who defeated death, and not just for himself, but for them, for me, for you, for all who will have him, he has defeated death, death has been defeated. I think you've heard that already today. And they suffered and died that we might know that they would not recant that message. They leave us the New Testament, and I've said this in the past, written to us in their blood. They have said, you know what, here's the deal. I am going to authenticate this thing that I have given my life to by giving my life for it. Paul is on his way to Rome. He's on a ship on his way to Rome. He's a prisoner on the ship on the way to Rome, and he's caught in a big storm. And it's not just like big in intensity. It's big in duration. So by the time that we pick up this story, here's what's happening. These guys have been in this storm for so long that at this point, it's been 14 days since they've had any food. They have despaired of life. They've decided we're all going down with the ship, and they've been so depressed, they haven't even eaten for two weeks. And what does Paul do? Because we're not just looking for Paul in the story. We're looking for Jesus. So be thinking Jesus. Paul calls a meeting on the ship. He's like, hey, here's the deal. I know I'm a prisoner. So maybe I don't have a lot of credibility with you guys, but history is going to judge me like really kindly. I'm going to make the short list on change the world. So, you know, maybe you should listen. I'm going to call a meeting, even though I'm prisoner guy on the ship and everybody's desperate enough to show up. So they're like, okay, fine. I mean, maybe this guy's got something to say. So he calls this meeting and notice what he does. Luke, who's writing this and who's there, personal witness, Acts 27, verse 33, says, as day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, today is the 14th day that you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore, he says, I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength. That's not what it actually says. What it actually says is, for this is for your salvation. Well, I'm hearing something in that. For not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you, Paul says. And when he had said these things, and again, we're thinking Jesus, what does he do? He takes the bread and giving thanks. He's blessing the bread to God in the presence of all, right? He broke it and he began to eat and then he distributed it. And then what happened? And then they were all encouraged and they ate some food themselves. Mason just walked us through this week. What does that sound like? It sounds like Thursday. This great, deadly political storm brewing all around Jesus and all of his disciples, and he calls them together, and what does he do? Among other things, he takes the bread. He blesses it. He breaks it. He distributes it. He says, this is for your salvation. Take. Eat. Okay, well, what happens after that? I mean, back on the boat, what happens is Paul gives them all their last supper on the boat, and then one of the sailors spots land for the first time in how long? I don't know. Definitely more than 14 days. And so the sailor says, what I imagine every sailor says when he spots land, he says, land ahoy, right? I have no idea. I am not a sailor. I don't know what sailors say. I'm just, I'm just thinking he's excited. So Paul has said, you're all going to make it. <laughs> and now they spot land. So they take the ship and they go straight at the land. And the problem is that between them and the land, there's a reef and they run the ship up on the reef and then literally everybody is cast out onto the sea. They're scattered on the sea in the midst of the storm, waves, wind, rain. And they're just looking for something to float on, man. 
I mean, they're just like, there's a timber, there's a plank, there's a barrel, you know, like there's a, there's a box, there's a thing going by. I, if it floats, I'm going to grab it. Like they're going up the wave and they're looking for the land and then coming down and up the wave and looking for somebody else and they're coming down. You get the idea? Like this is a perilous thing. Waves going over, wind blasting them. They're trying to surfboard it to the shore, which they do. They do. But it's every man for himself as they're scattered upon the sea. What happens after the Last Supper with Jesus? Mason told us. They go to the Garden of Gethsemane, and Judas comes with a small army and arrests him. And what do the disciples do? Because Jesus had told them what they would do, and by the way, told them they'd be okay in the end. He said, hey, here's what's going to happen. He plucks a verse out of the Old Testament. It says, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. These guys run for their lives, man. It is every man for himself, okay. Well, back to Paul. Paul and the crew and the passengers make it safely ashore. He had said that they would and they do. And then look what happens. Acts 28, verse 1, it says that after, Luke talking, after we were brought safely through all the way to the shore, so we, we made it somehow, we then learned that the island that we just washed up upon was called Malta, and the native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire because it's cold, and welcomed us all because it had become to rain, begun to rain and it was cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks, so what, is, what are sticks made of? Just shout it out, it's okay. If you know the answer, go with it. Wood, yeah. Yeah, lacking in enthusiasm. But that is the right answer. If you know it, just go with it. Just be confident. You know, no embarrassment here. Like, sticks are made of wood. So Paul is carrying what? Wood. Same five. Okay. <laughs> He's carrying wood. And he took the wood, these sticks, and he put them on a fire, right? And, and a viper, the very emblem of evil and death, a poisonous, deadly so snake, came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. Okay, so wait a minute. Let me think about this for a second. So we've got one who is carrying wood, right? And he's pierced in the hand by the very emblem of evil and death. Sound like anybody? Jesus carries the wood upon which his hands are literally pierced and nailed so that he might defeat evil and death. In his death, for me and for you and for all who will have him, but here's what happens with the native people. Like the natives see this and they, they recognize the creature. It's indigenous to their island. They know what happens when you get bitten by one of these snakes. A hundred out of a hundred times you die. As we'll see in a second, they even know the symptoms that you manifest before you die. So they see this happen to Paul and they know that he's just washed up on shore before this. And they assume something to be true about him, which is not true. They say, no doubt this man is a murderer. He's got to be a criminal. Because even though he has escaped alive from the sea, justice, meaning God in justice, has not allowed him to live, but instead God has hunted him down and taken his life through the piercing of his hand by this deadly snake, which also sounds like Jesus. He's crucified between two criminals. So what does everybody assume? That he's a criminal. But why was he crucified? To satisfy justice. Who's justice? God's justice. For whose crimes? His? No, he committed no crimes. I have. For me. You know, the reality is, and I've said this in the past, that every debt gets paid, and the reality is, man, we all of us have lived for ourselves instead of God and have accrued a debt with him that we cannot pay. God, in love, sent Jesus to lay down an infinitely valuable life in the place of all of us who cannot pay our debt that we might claim that payment on our behalf. He has satisfied the justice of God and made the way for us to have relationship of love, of joy, of peace, all of these things that we long for with a heavenly Father. And then what happens after Jesus dies? Well, he's buried, okay? Holy Saturday. And then he's risen from the dead. He defeats death. Guys, it's Easter. What happens with Paul? He defeats death too. Listen to what Luke says. It says that Paul, however, shook this creature off into the fire, and then he suffered no harm from its deadly bite. Meanwhile, the natives, who all have an understanding of this snake and know that 100 out of 100 who get bitten by it die and know the symptoms, were waiting for Paul to swell up, because that's what usually happens, or suddenly fall down dead. That's the other option. But when they had waited a long time and they saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds about Paul and said that he was a god, because you have to be a god to defeat death. 
See the logic? They're not wrong. What does Thomas say when he's presented with the risen Jesus? My Lord and my God. All right, do you see the pattern? There's a lot more to it. I spared you a lot of details. You with me so far? Here's what I want you to understand. Paul didn't see the pattern. He didn't see it, at least not in the moment. He did not see this pattern. You know, like he's not going down with the ship and calling everybody together and blessing the bread and going, this is for your salvation and handing it and thinking, this is just like Jesus, you know, when he, he instituted communion. Like, no, the ship's dashed and everybody's scattered. He's like, just like the disciples. He's not thinking that. He's thinking, good grief, get to the shore, you know? When he's carrying the wood, he's not going, Jesus carried wood. When he's bitten by the serpent, he's not going, his hand was pierced by the emblem of evil and death. When he survives, he doesn't think, it's like Jesus, he was risen from the dead. And when they call him a God, he's not like, well, that's what they said of the Lord. You know what he's thinking? And I don't know this, like I haven't interviewed him, but I, I'm pretty sure because he's a person and I'm a person and you're people, you ready? He's thinking, good grief, how much worse can things get? What the heck? I'm doing good, I get arrested, all of this stuff, and then I'm on a ship, we were enjoying a nice cruise, and then the storm, you gotta be kidding me. We're starving, the ship is dashed, I'm thrown into the ocean with everybody else, it's everybody, you know, and then I try to do a good thing with the natives, and I'm just trying to be helpful, you know, and I bring the sticks over, and the next thing you know, I got this dadgum snake hanging from my hand, and everybody going, well, he's got about four minutes, you know, like, thank you, Lord, for saving my life, grateful for that, He's not seeing any of this. <laughs> what do you think he's praying? I think he's praying, Lord, help me to hang on to my faith in this moment. <laughs> Please, God. Because the evil one who is the accuser is coming and he's, going, he's just gathering up all of these seemingly senseless circumstances, all of which are painful and perilous to me. And he's saying to me, hey, how can God be good in this? How can God be faithful and this? How can God be all-powerful and this? How can God be present all the time, everywhere, and this? You sure he's there? You sure he's listening? You sure he exists? I don't know. I'm feeling better about the story, guys. I, I, I do. I, I, like, this has been helpful to me. Counseling session out loud. Paul didn't see how his sufferings were connected to the pattern of the sufferings of Jesus. But the pattern is there, and if you think about it then, we now can see the purpose in those sufferings for him that he could not see. And what is the purpose? Because it's been preserved, this story for us, by God through Luke. The purpose is to make it clear to every one of us that embedded in the midst of your storms, embedded in the midst of the shipwrecks of your life, embedded in those moments in your life, in those seasons of your life in which you are overwhelmed with evil and death, is the power, the person, the presence of a suffering, dying, risen Savior who comes to deliver you from evil and death and who is present in the midst of it with you even and maybe most particularly when you can't see him. And I feel pretty good about that lesson. I feel like, you know, that might be helpful. So I'm going to ask you three questions and we're done. The first question is, do you know Jesus? Because that's really where it begins. It just, it is. I mean, as you look around for someone who defeats death, who else you got? You know, like, I mean, you got your, your betting on someone, hey, I think I'm going to do this. I don't think so. You know, like I just... I'm pretty sure that person's going to defeat death for not just for himself, but for all of humanity. I'm pretty sure he's not. Only God can defeat death. Don't miss that. The natives got it. And he's defeated it for you. Your debt paid by him. The debt's undeniable. The inability to pay is undeniable. The offer, which is completely free, is undeniable. It's an attractive offer. Come, let us pray for you after this service. Come, let us explain that to you after this. Come to Ever Wonder on Thursday. Do you know Jesus? That's where it all begins. Secondly, are you in a storm right now that is making a shipwreck of your life 
And here's my add to that. Does anyone know? Like sometimes you're in a storm, it's making shipwreck of your life. There's no hiding it. Can we agree? Like, I mean, it's just everything's a disaster. It's humiliating. And anybody who takes a look at you can tell. It's like, yes, storm. And sometimes it's all here and nobody knows. You know, one of the great statements that comes to us, one of many great statements that comes to us out of the recovery community is this statement, you are only as sick as your secrets. Did you hear that? It's like a boil, man. It's unhealthy and it needs to be lanced. And lanced looks like I'm going to tell somebody what my secret is. I'm in a storm. It's making shipwreck of my life. Literally nobody knows about this. And I need to lance this dude by letting someone into my life. And here's what we do. We construct all of these arguments. All of them are prideful for reasons not to do that. Oh, nobody can help me with this. Oh, I just want to stop and go, yes, they can. And I've seen it literally hundreds of times. God uses the Spirit, the Word. He uses His people. He uses counselors. He uses all kinds of folks as instruments of deliverance in the lives of people who did not believe they could be delivered. So, are you in a storm right now that's making a shipwreck of your life? Does anyone know about it? If not, then resolve today to tell somebody and make this the day. And don't go home and talk yourself out of it, or come forward right after the service, tell one of us, and let us try to point you in the right direction. Thirdly, will you entrust your storm to Jesus, who is right there with you in the midst of it, even and perhaps most especially when you can't see him? You've been cast out onto the sea. You know, the waves are going up, and you're trying to figure out which direction the land is, so you know where to swim. You're looking for something to grab that's going to float like a life preserver that's going to get you all the way to the shore. There's only one. But he's right there with you. So you don't have to reach far. You just have to receive. Guys, this is the day that we celebrate the defeat of death. What a day. It's a good day. And I would encourage you Don't leave here without life, okay? All right, let me pray for us.